Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White. What a beautiful afternoon we have today. We have such a special myth salon on synchronicity today and already the day has been filled with synchronicities. So the first thing I would like to do is just you know, have a moment of silence as we welcome ourselves in. We are making leaps and bounds progress with the coronavirus. Uh, there's no way to say that uh, we're out of the woods yet, but we can actually take a trip, get vaccinated. There are many, many of us who have had our first and second vaccinations and in a week, my wife and I will get on the plane for the first time in more than a year, we're gonna go visit my mom in Hawaii. So I would like to just open it up today, have a, have a quick moment of silence for the people who are no longer here. They didn't make it through the coronavirus. So, all right, let's get ourselves oriented here. I'm particularly troubled these days about the amount of abuse that various ethnicities and nationalities have been experiencing. And it just completely surprises me that Asian Americans would in some way be singled out as a population group. I personally have always sort of romanticized the East but I have a poem that I would like to bring in today by a San Francisco poet, I believe. Her name is Marilyn Chin. We are Americans now, we live in the tundra. Today in hazy San Francisco, I face seaward toward China, a giant begonia, pink, fragrant, bitten by verdigris and insects. I sing her uh, a blues song. Even a Chinese girl gets the blues. Her reticence is black and blue. Let's sing about the extinct Bengal tigers, about the giant pandas. Ling Ling loves Jing Jing. Yet we will not mate. We are not impotent. We are important. We blame the environment. We blame the zoo. What shall we plant for the future? Bamboo, sassafras, co coconut palms? No. Legumes, wheat, maize, old swine to melt the new. We are Americans now. We live in the tundra of the logical, a sea of cities, a wood of cars. Farewell, my ancestors, hirsute Daoists. Failed scholars, farewell. My wet nurse who feared and loathed the Catholics who called out, now that the half men have occupied Canton, hide your daughters, lock your doors. So as we surround ourselves with otherness, let's all be others. Let's give space to those among us who feel the footsteps that we are walking. And let's try walking in somebody else's footsteps and create a path of compassion as we go forward. Let's see if we can find some companions on this trip. So, Will, why don't you take it from here and let's have ourselves a good time with Joe Cambray and with Christoph and Chris Vogler and the rest of the panelists and everybody attending. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone.
Thanks, Dana. Uh, looking forward to a really cool, really awesome event. And, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be some twists and turns as, as is the want when we're talking about synchronicity. Uh, but before I get started and before I introduce the panel, uh, as, as I usually do, I want to share a few announcements and express some gratitude. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for being here. It's because y'all keep coming and we keep going. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the Pacifica Alumni Association for always supporting these Smith Salons and for supporting this particular duo of events, starting with the event with Jeff Kripal uh, a couple weeks ago. I want to thank Michael Weesey Productions. Uh, Michael Weesey Productions is the leading publisher of books on film, and it's a real honor that they've decided to elevate these events to their audience. So thank you. And thank you to Chris, Chris Vogler, for being here to reinforce our effort to bring more myth to more storytellers. Uh, and with that, I also i have got to give some thanks to AJ. I didn't tell him I was going to do this. Y'all might not know AJ, but AJ, can you turn on your camera for just a second? Um, this, is, this is who makes this website look so good uh, and who's been making all these tremendous portals and who's been managing the newsletters and all these things. So I uh, just want to say thank you to AJ for all of your incredible work. <clears throat> and I'm going to show off some of your work now. Uh, and Dana, I think that the portal share or that the, the screen share is going to work for me. Let's see here. Uh, this is the transformational narrative portal family. And so these are, first of all, transformational narrative. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, just looking for a way to draw a circle around individuation and the hero's journey and rites of passage and screenplay and how to sell something and how to go on an adventure. These are all these narrative processes, narratives of transformation. And I believe that they should all be in dialogue with one another, that those that are studying it from the point of view of, of individuation as a depth psychologist have a lot to share with those who are just engaging transformational patterns uh, from the perspective of a screenwriter and vice versa. Some of the greatest uh, mythologists of the last century have been storytellers like Tolkien. So you'll find opportunity to dive deep into various transformational narratives. We'll continue to add to them. And I just wanna point you to one that's particularly relevant to today to get us started. This is the one for uh, individuation um, and which is, as we'll find, very related to synchronicity. And you can find some information. Basically here, you'll just see various uh, sources of information, sources of uh, basically Wikipedia, encyclopedia entries, but so many people don't get past Wikipedia. And we really wanna pe point people past Wikipedia by curating high quality resources that you can dig into to find out more about individuation. Click here and check out some, do a deep dive into the video content around individuation. And you can go deeper here into information on Carl Jung, uh, individuation, synchronicity, and uh, the man of the hour today, Joe Cambrai. Uh, so if you'd like to find out more or explore more um, around individuation, synchronicity, Joe Cambrai. Also, we have one for Chris Vogler and the writer's journey. Check out the website, check out these portals and go in some deep dives uh, if you have uh, further interest than we get into tonight. So thank y'all for indulging me to show y'all for just a moment what that's about. We're really excited about those. And we believe that they're incredible resources for storytellers, for educators, for psychologists, and especially, of course, for mythologists. So um, with that, let's dive in. Uh, let's dive into the panel. You all know Dana White, who's a scholar, author, host of This Myth Salon, and contributing faculty at Pacifica Graduate Institute. My name is Will Lin. I'm the founder of Myth House and the general education department at Hushin College, where I teach myth to filmmakers and performing artists. We're also joined by uh, D Dr. Dennis Patrick Slattery, a mythology scholar, poet, longtime professor in Pacifica's doctoral program in mythology, and a prolific author. To check out his books and tours and events, uh, you're going to want to visit DennisPatrickSlattery.com, which when it's shared below, you know it's AJ. Selena Matthews is a clinical psychologist, author, and keynote speaker who graduated from Pacifica and has been an ever-present participant and supporter of the Myth Salon. She's the CEO of Soul Transformation Seminars. Zaman Stanazai is professor of mythology and political science at Pacifica and Cal State, a poet, linguist, mystic, and Fulbright scholar. He has written extensively on a wide range of topics from Indo-Iranian languages to identity politics, political philosophy, Sufi poetry, and esoteric Islamic thought. And Chris Vogler, who's joining us tonight, and he joined us last week and has been with us for some wonderful salons. Some of you may remember our very first online salon was with Chris. Uh, Chris is the author of The Writer's Journey, 
former studio executive, story analyst, and speaker at writers workshops and conferences all over the world. Thank you for being with us tonight, Chris. And we're also joined by a special guest. Some of you may remember him from a myth salon we had when we were in Dana's living room a couple of years ago. Christophe Lemuel is uh, trained as a quantum physicist and did his theoretical research in high energy physics for several years in France and Greece. He's also worked as a project manager at the National Center for Nuclear Energy in Paris, France, before moving to Los Angeles in 2007. He's currently the executive director of the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles and the science editor of the Jungian journal uh, Psychological Perspectives. Thank you for being with us. Couldn't, couldn't uh, express my gratitude enough. Um, and it's really cool because actually uh, Christoph and uh, Joe and I have had some conversations together separately around individuation, more specifically around synchronicity. So this is a really, really cool uh, opportunity to be together with all of you. And Joe Cambray is the, uh, and I'm going to pull up my wonderful go-to reference on MythHouse.org. Joe Cambray is the CEO and president of Pacifica. He's also the past president of the International Association for Analytical Psychology, which, for those of you who don't know, manages much of what the young institutes and various young organ organizations do around the world. He served as the editor, the U.S. editor for the Journal of Analytical Psychology and is on the editorial boards of the Journal of Analytical Psychology, the Young Journal of Culture and Psyche, and the Israel Annual of Psychoanalytic Theory, Research, and Practice. He's been a faculty member at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Center for Psychoanalytic Studies, adjunct faculty at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Dr. Cambrai is a Jungian analyst, uh, and his numerous publications include the book based on his uh, lectures, Synchronicity, Nature, and Psyche as an, inter as an Interconnected Universe in a volume edited with Linda Carter, Analytical Psychology, Contemporary Perspectives, and Jungian Psychology. So thank you for joining us today, Joe. I couldn't be more grateful and honored by your presence. Uh, your, <laughs> your bio goes on and on and on and on. So thank you. Really looking forward to where we go with synchronicity and where we go with individuation. And I know it'll be a really valuable topic for our audience, storytellers, mythologists, and depth psychologists. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Will. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with all of you. Um, it, it feels like a particularly uh, a charged moment in, in our culture and our history uh, with this last year of the pandemic and as that uh, undergoes some changes. Uh, well, it's not formally in this talk, we can spend some time if people would like to talk about the virus and uh, the synchronistic phenomena around uh, the novel coronavirus because all viruses are um, basically cycloid in nature. That's where they fundamentally live. And so therefore, um, one expects these kinds of uh, activations to occur at that level of the psyche. But before we go off on that, let me go ahead and start with uh, sharing a PowerPoint that I have. So there we go. Um, and what I'd like to cover briefly is the notion of synchronicity is an a causal connecting principle based on meaningful coincidences. This is the way Jung, of course, defined it. And that has to be seen in some way against the context of the kind of enlightenment scientization of Western society. Um, other societies outside of Western Europe uh, would have had other ways of describing these kind of phenomena. And now as we get into the 21st century, we actually need to reclaim some of that because while well, synchronicity is an enormously valuable tool to helping us with uh, out of our cultural milieu understand that, there are other understandings that are parallel to it that will enrich it. I'm gonna to touch on a few of those. But first I wanna start with the history. How did this concept develop? Where did it come from in Jung's thought? Um, and what has been some of the development over the past 20 years or so. And particularly what for this group uh, that's myth focused and so um, oriented towards culture, I wanna talk about cultural synchronicities because that's something that doesn't get developed terribly much in the literature on this. I've written a tiny bit, the last chapter of my book has something, but I still think it's a topic that deserves a lot more research. So um, let's go to, where did this notion come from? Well, 
Um, when I first wrote the book on synchronicity, I had bits and pieces, but the Red Book had not yet been published. So I didn't really have the chance to take the deep dive that I, if I were to do another edition of the book, I would now start there. Because it's very clear that um, in October of 1913, uh, Jung and Freud uh, severed their personal relationship and remain only professionally connected. And it's, it's very... Um, distressing for both men. Both men go through a lot of psychological upheaval. Within a month, Jung is on a train going from Zurich to Schaffhausen to visit his relatives, and he has a waking dream. He's he's awake. He, he ends up in a reverie in which he sees um, Europe beginning to fill up with blood. Um, and he's quite disturbed by this because as a well-trained psychiatrist working with um, schizophrenic patients, he recognizes the significance and meaning of this kind of upwelling of material from the psyche. Um, and yet he does something really unexpected. Rather than sealing it off, as most would do at that point, he decides this is a place where he needs exploration. And of course, this is where he develops the techniques of active imagination, borrowing from his uh, use of uh, auto-hypnotic techniques he'd learned in Paris with uh, Pierre Janet and some of the yoga that he's learned. And he begins to apply it to his own internal world, going into these affectively charged states, whether from dreams or from uh, eruptions in his imagination. And really, um, he starts in late November, early December, and goes all the way um, until April, when they finally begin to settle down a bit. But this is the magma, the raw material of where um, his uh, visionary experience of the Red Book uh, comes from. And what we'll see is that's his point of entrance. Uh, by June, things are calming down. He's starting to feel like he's restabilizing. And he has the dreams of um, a, a frost coming a deep profound frost that causes leaves to curl up and form these very succulent grapes that have healing juices in them, but this is still frozen. Um, and he's pondering this. He can feel that he has something to offer the masses as it were. About two months later, August 1st, um, the guns of August, we have World War I break out. And now Jung finds himself on the horns of a tremendous dilemma. That is, has he had a prophetic set of visions? Remember, this happens twice for him, these, this, these sets of visions of Europe filling up with blood. And is he becoming a, a, a madman or is he becoming a prophet? Neither of which is a, a resolution that he finds palatable or reasonable. And to deal with this, he takes a, his deep journey into the interior. This is his individuation journey. So where does that lead? I want to go to the Red Book now, the, the visuals from there, because I think they capture much of the essence of this. Uh, on your um, left, you'll see from very early on in, in the Red Book, it's from the first part, uh, Liber Primus, uh, right very near the beginning, he has a dream of the hero being attacked by uh, a beetle and represents this in, in, in a vision that he's had. You see a setting sun being uh, assaulted by a bunch of black snakes and this scarabide beetle chasing the blonde hero, which is certainly a representation of Jung and his scientism that I mentioned before. Now, just to keep a note here, uh, the beetle is going to be extremely important because um, 20 years later, when he's writing up the case of the synchronous, the famous synchronicity case, he is going to use the story of a woman who has a dream of a, a piece of golden jewelry uh, that's in the shape of a scarab being given to her at a uh, at a party, and at just that moment, there's a knocking on the window. Young opens it, catches a scarab beetle that has flown in and says, "Here's your beetle." And that moment was a moment of lysis in the case. And that he said that the woman who was somebody who was locked up, uh, imprisoned by her own rationality, and this uh, influx of the irrational of the synchronistic uh, opened up the case and, and began to produce a real transformation for this woman. What he doesn't say there, and we didn't know until we saw some of these materials, is that his own countertransference must have been very powerful because this is, he knew that beetle. It had been part and parcel of his own experience. 
He certainly knew the image on the right uh, and would have recognized that. This would be in the night sea journey, uh, the, the journey that the sun undergoes in the Egyptian mythology of the dead. It, it goes into the underworld, the 12 steps of the underworld, 12 stages. And early on, the, uh, the beetle god, uh, beetle-headed god, Kofri, holds the sun on, on the solar bark uh, as it's carried through the underworld. Uh, again, a lot of parallels. But you see the solar hero in that image again on the left. Um, that's a very difficult place psychologically. You're in the drink. You're really swimming for your life. Um, and it's an overwhelming feeling that's got to be with that. If you know the Red Book, you'll know the arc of the Red Book is chronological in terms of the pages. So when we get to page 55, we have this image. Um, and here the relationship with the depths has now changed. This is a year or so later. You've got the Leviathan, the, the danger of the depth on one hand, but now that that solar hero uh, in, in, uh, imaged in this golden um, egg sun figure is now on the bark and it's part of the journey. Therefore, we have a sense of a psychological separation of ego and archetype here, and that we see this kind of moving in tandem. Now it's no longer being pursued. You notice that they're, they're moving in accord. And that's a great psychological shift that you can see in, just in the imagery. This unfolds, and it's really wonderful to spend days and days going through the imagery and watching the transformations. But uh, for purposes of time, I want to move to the denouement of our, our narrative. And that is, how does Jung get out of that dilemma? Well, the, he, as he tells it, the, the famous image that happens is here. In 1928, you can see that if you go to page 163 of the Red Book and you read there, it's in German, but you can read. He's, he's basically saying, uh, in 1928, I received um, from my friend Richard Wilhelm a, a copy of an ancient Taoist manuscript called The Secret of the Golden Flower. I was asked to do a forward and a and, uh, commentary. And this was a transformative moment because as Jung describes it, he was in the middle of working on this mandala, the one you see there on page 163. Uh, and he was very struck by the quality of his mandala and the frontispiece of the um, Golden Flower Manuscript, which was this image of the Vajra mandala here. Um, Jung said that the colors match. Now that's an interesting question. I've not been able to find the actual original. I talked to the Wilhelm's granddaughter and so forth, and she only has the black and white version as well. It's a, it's a little bit of a mystery, but apparently the uh, greenish yellow struck Jung as somehow, uh, even on it, within his own fantasy before he received this um, as part of this. Now, um, that laced open the question of, uh, of what he was doing with the Red Book. And he goes on to say he was able to then set down the Red Book activity and return to the world in the world of science. Well, what does that mean? Well, the same year in 1928, when you read the Dream Analysis Seminars, you'll see that in November of 28, Jung's conducting a seminar on dreams in which they are looking at a patient of his, uh, some dream imagery, and it ends up with uh, uh, the image of a ball and Jung um, does a long amplification on this. And the patient spontaneously, on, who doesn't know about the seminar, produces the image within a week of the so, a solar disk between the horns uh, of a bull. And it is matched by numerous people in the seminar all having some kind of connection to bull imagery. I mean, it was really stunning to the point where they stopped the seminar and people were saying, Dr. Jung, what's going on? What's happening here? And what Jung said uh, to the group, he said, well, look, in, in the West, we have a predilection for cause and effect. That's the way we understand. That's our cosmology. But in the East, there's more what we would call kairos, a coming together in time, the quality of the moment. And that's what we're looking at here, that all of these things are coming together synchronously. And the editors of the uh, Dream uh, Analysis Seminar say, this is the very first use of the term uh, that leads to synchronicity. 
This is in a private seminar. He doesn't use it publicly for a couple of years until 1930. But you can now understand what Jung is saying that in 28 with this seminar, he receives this secret of the golden flower. It's coming together and his solution that transcends madness or prophecy is synchronicity. That is, it is something fundamental to the nature of the universe. It is not a personal acquisition. Yes, the psyche of a person can be open up to this. They can be receptive to it and things will happen, although you don't cause it. Uh, it's a it's a being in touch and being resonant with the moment, but it's about patterns of the universe coming together. And that's what he's picking up on. Now, what he doesn't say here, and you'll have to pull the strands together, if you go back a year from this, and now we have a little clearer evidence in the um, black books, but it was in January the 2nd of, uh, of 1927, uh, more than a year before this happened, he had the very famous Liverpool dream. This is a dream in which Jung is in, uh, he's imagining himself in, in the city of Liverpool and it's sooty and rainy and dark and cold. And he's with another group of Swiss and um, they're walking through and they come to the, the alley of the dead and the, uh, Peter's church and so forth. And Jung then has a vision there um, of a, an island uh, with a magnolia tree on it in full bloom that's in the sun. It's the only sunny place. And um, he, it's said that uh, there's a Swiss who lives in Liverpool and Jung, by, even in the dream as he's waking up, he uh, understands in a deep way the meaning of that dream being um, it's, it's this central experience of the self the achievement of the self that he is witnessing in that dream of the a magnolia tree on the island that's so key. And he, he says this was the culminating dream that gave him the notion of, of um, individuation. Now, the golden flower comes a year later, but you see the resonance, that golden flower of the magnolia tree, the mulan tree in, or a yulan tree in Chinese, uh, which has some very interesting healing properties, by the way, that's a that's a whole nother piece. But basically, the Jung's vision uh, is a premonition of exactly this, which happens a year later. It's a kind of a fulfillment where the golden flower actually comes in uh, the form of a manuscript that points him towards alchemy. And this is where Jung goes from here. He now exits the, the Red Book by and large uh, over the next couple of years and really begins to pursue the, the study of historical study of alchemy where he is finding historical evidence to demonstrate the individuation process that he has uh, found through his own work and get, becomes affirmed in these cultural examples, whether from the East or from the West. Um, uh, just before we leave this piece of synchronicity, I want you to see where Jung took this because this is still very early days for Jung in 28. Um, and even when he mentions it at Wilhelm's memorial service, it's not a tremendously well articulated idea. It really doesn't get fully seated until he begins his dialogue with Wolfgang Pauli. And that happens in 1932 when Pauli's referred to him for treatment and uh, after a, a bit um, of things that happen with uh, another therapist and so forth, Jung actually forms a, an ongoing relationship and correspondence out of which emerges the synchronicity essay in, in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, and as a part of that essay, there's a famous statement in there. Um, Jung says, since experience has shown that under certain conditions, space and time can be reduced to almost zero, Causality disappears along with them because causality is bound up with the existence of space and time and physical changes and consists essentially in the succession of cause and effect. For this reason, synchronistic phenomena cannot in principle be associated with any conception of causality. Well, when you look at that and you look at the date, I mean, this was first articulated in 1948 in his Aranos lecture where he's first capturing this. This is within a year or two of um, Fred Hoyle's articulating the Big Bang Theory, where space and time have, um, this is the origin point. It's our scientific uh, myth of origin. It's our creation myth. Um, and in that, at the very first instance of creation, there are, there are no laws of physics. 
when you go where space and time collapse to almost zero, if you run the thing backwards in a way, um, you end up in a place before gravity, before electromagnetism, before the weak or strong nuclear forces have yet come into existence. And what he's saying is in that place, starting there, there is a pattern formation. And modern cosmologists would be fine with this, to be honest. This is the wrinkles in space and time that create reality in a way. But that patterning is not a causal patterning. It's a fundamental shape of our universe. And this is the cosmology Jung is inviting us into in a very deep way to embrace. And it transcends the enlightenment scientism of his day and that what we've been in since the middle of the 17th century. We're still yet to claim this. Where I want to go tonight with it is also to show that it has some decolonial components to it. That Jung didn't articulate these, but I think it's hidden in this because when we go back to this origin point, you no longer have the separations of subject and object. That's a later phenomena. So this is a place before subjectivity and objectivity have been split apart. That's crucial because that's the kind of porosity that makes the link that, that really is key to this whole notion of synchronicity. So when I first was approaching this, it wasn't as a theoretician, it was as a clinician. I had uh, several cases of, of people who'd had very severe trauma histories, and there were a number of synchronistic uh, experiences that got activated in the treatments. I've, I've told the famous case for me, famous um, of the Black Forest. This was a, a patient I had who had a very severe trauma history. And as a part of an unusual aspect of the treatment, we agreed to one phone call when um, I, was, uh, I was away out of the area. And in that call, um, she immediately was very anxious and said, um, where are you? Are you in Germany? And I, I said, no, I'm not in Germany. Well, why are you asking? And she said, well, I dreamed you were in the Black Forest and I couldn't find you and I was terrified. Um, and so we worked to help stabilize her and it, it actually was quite successful, but the, I was in the Caribbean and the next day I was going diving and the site, my very first dive in open water was to a site called the Black Forest. I didn't know that until we got near to the site. The dive master said, oh, by the way, the, where, the, today's dive is called the, the Black Forest because it's black coral. And it was an exquisite dive. And what it, when I came up out of it, after I got over my anxiety and did the dive, I realized that we were in a third, we were in an image that held us both. Very different vertices in that image. Uh, we were in the image of a black forest. And that forest for her was uh, reminiscent of Grimm's fairy tales and you know, witches and monsters that would eat you up. Mine was a transcendent experience to another world. And yet they were both black forests. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more of my work uh, more recently with uh, rhizomes and, and I'm back in the forest again, uh, un unbeknownst to me when I first started to do that. That's, that's the way these archetypal patterns unfold. But that led me, that when I, working with that patient, led me to some research that was done at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. And what that was, was a group of Nobel laureates who got together and said, you know, each of us are really skilled in our own discipline. But the most interesting questions at this point in history are not what I know about physics or what you know about mathematics or you know about chemistry or you in economics, but what lies in between. It's where it, it's the interactive field. And, and this is transdisciplinary. Uh, it starts with some inter interdisciplinary, but it's ultimately transdisciplinary and a very deep root. And Susan Roland has been a champion of this here at Pacifica. And I, I have much respect for that perspective because it really links with where I'm going here. Um, when What they began to look at were, um, how do you understand the complexity of systems in the, in the world? And one of the things their research taught them very quickly was that um, there, many of the more complex phenomena come out of the interactions between things, whether those are molecules or people uh, or galaxies. And when the interactions are under competitive conditions, you get what's called emergent forms that transcend. There, there was where the sum of what's going on is greater than the parts. So a very simple example, glass of water. One of the, one of the 
questions you could ask is, why is it liquid at room temperature? As a quantum physicist, uh, you would look at water as single molecule water, and that wouldn't be obvious. You'd look at the weight of hydrogen sulfide, just where you place sulfur um, by the oxygen by sulfur, and it's a gas at room temperature. So what is it about water? Well, it's not inherent in the molecule itself. It's the interactions between them. These interactions here produce that liquidity. That's an emergent property. Um, let's look at some other things from nature. There's a lots and lots of emergent forms. Here is a, a form of an ant bridge. You can see the ants are crossing from one rock to the other. They use their bodies to construct a bridge. Now, there's no internal image of a bridge inside of an ant. It's emergent in the environment. It's the way in which organisms interact with their environments and they create things, sometimes temporarily, sometimes more permanently. And that form, that, that's the emergent form is um, what is the complex uh, experience. Now, if you think about synchronicity, that my patient and myself, we both have an experience that we both contribute to something. And that third, that, that bridge in this case, or that black forest in our case, it, that synchronistic form that holds us both is a complex form. It's the emergent property of our interactions. So that same principle goes throughout nature. I'll give you a couple of more examples. The human microbiome. We all have this, you know, um, a human being uh, is shockingly only has about 25,000 genes. When, when, um, the Human Genome Project was begun in the late 90s and into the early 2000s. We thought that there would be about 200,000. We thought it'd be about 10 times more uh, genetic uh, material than in fact we have. Um, it, there, there are lots of reasons for that, how we develop our complexity, but <clears throat> one of the things that quickly came of this was to study all of the organisms on and in us that is the uh, fungi and the bacteria and the viruses, they, they form, we form an ecology. And when you take that ecology, it, it only accounts for maybe five, 10% of your, your weight if you took all that substance in and on us, that living substance. But in terms of genetic uh, material, it's about two to 3 million genes. In other words, a hundredfold more genetic material is there. And that does shape us. In other words, what I'm getting at is we're going to decenter, delocalize who we are. And the psyche is a further extension of that. It, you know, that we are, um, we ourselves are not completely local and we're in a distributed network and our psyche is much more so. Uh, it really is an interactive field. Um, and the synchronistic experiences are in these kinds of fields. They are not within just simple, um, you know, condensed uh, intra-psychic events. So one more uh, example from nature. Um, here's starlings. Uh, they, as they go to protect themselves at night before they roost, they they often go through these elaborate dances and produce really these remarkable forms. Anybody who's interested, put in murmuration, which is the name for these patterns. And do it. Just put it into YouTube, and you will get the, some of the most remarkable images of of the way these patterns of uh, starling uh, murmurations occur. Often set to music of various sorts. Classical music seems to be one that people like. It, it carries a, an enormous uh, resonance with these things. But it's the way nature seems to act in wholes rather than simply as individuals. And the way individuals create something more than. By the way, this murmuration is very effective in protecting the individuals. Uh, this is a, actually a, a evolutionary adaptive strategy because um, there are lots of images it's like peregrine falcons, which will hunt starlings, will go after this and they cannot focus on an individual. This movement overwhelms their capacity to hone in on the individual. And you'll see them fly off in frustration because they can't get a meal out of this, um, this protected. This is aesthetics and um, self-protection simultaneously. So um, I, I love that this, the idea that biology is, uh, and, and our impulses are not simply just, uh, you know, the Darwinian survival, but there's an aesthetic dimension to them as well, the way they are expressed. I think that's extremely important. Okay. 
that's just a quick tour. Now, what if we were to take some of these ideas and think about them in terms of culture? So I'm going to take one example from my book and an example or two beyond my book. Uh, in the book, what I talk about, um, I give three, four examples of cultural synchronicities, that is like the origins of uh, democracy. And the second one is about <clears throat> the encounter of um, uh, the Spanish with the native peoples of the Americas. In particular, I'll look at Cortez and Moctezuma between uh, a 16th century Spaniard and 16th century Aztec. And uh, what's remarkable about that are the synchronicities that uh, Cortez had no idea of himself. He manipulated and used them in a very powerful way. And this is a kind of a mythic narrative I, we're, because we're gonna look at archetypal activation. The story in, starts with the Aztecs uh, having their sovereignty, their, their sense of rulership and, and power in, in, the, um, in the country of Mexico, uh, especially in their capital of Tenochtitlan, uh, through Quetzalcoatl. That's the kind of uh, Toltec ancestry that they use. And in part of the stories about um, uh, Quetzalcoatl, there's the story of uh, Tolt. Tolpitz and Quetzalcoatl, and there's, there's some complexity about several different historical figures here. But here's the plume serpent. Um, here it is in the shape of a man, uh, and you'll see that he's bearded. And part of the narrative that's really uh, striking about uh, this Quetzalcoatl is that he um, sails off uh, he's been tricked by a sorcerer and he vows to return to Mexico uh, in the future. And he sails off at what would be today the site of Veracruz and either uh, is emulated or is, uh, he ascends into the sky. Um, he, and he is said to return, but no one knows when. And the year that he returns, there's an astrological set of predictions from them, from the Aztec and Mayan calendars that say the year that he returns will be very important. Well, the year in question for us is 1519. And that year was the year of reeds, one reeds in, in the Aztec calendar. And it meant that when Quetzalcoatl returned, it would be at the, at the level of um, an assault on the ruler, on the king. The kind of arrows that he had would be the ones that would be aimed at the, uh, at the ruler. So here's some examples, uh, just to give you a little bit of um, a sort of a feeling for the imagery of uh, Quetzalcoatl as a bearded figure. And this is unusual because in Mesoamerica, this kind of facial hair um, is, is not in the indigenous people, was not this strong. Um, but it was very marked in the figure of uh, the Mayan figure of Kukla Khan uh, or Quetzalcoatl have this kind of bearded uh, plume serpent. And so when you see Cortez, you see how he fits the fantasy. And where does he land? He, he, come, he lands on, on Good Friday of 1519 at the, at the site of Veracruz. He returns exactly where the myth says. Now he doesn't know this at first. He finds this out through his uh, various people who have, uh, have um, served as interpreters and so forth to him. I, and there are then a series of 10 major coincidences in um, Aztec, uh, cosmology, they get linked to what's happening. They're very closely linked. There's a, a book called uh, Irony and Empire by David Carrasco, who details these in, in, at some length. It, it, I've got a reference to it in the book, but you can see <clears throat> how Cortez manifests this. And in the encounter, here we have the figure of La Malinche or Dona Marina. This is a, a a woman who was um, uh, enslaved uh, in the Mayan world or in the Yucatan where he picked her up first before he came to the mainland. Um, and he's, she's extremely intelligent um, and she uh, picks up enough Spanish to actually be able to interpret between the uh, indigenous languages of, in, of various um, societies in Mexico and Spanish. And here she is helping Cortez. Um, for which she's vilified. And she's also uh, the mother of the country in, in some other ways, uh, a very, very interesting figure. But the coincidence, <clears throat> excuse me, the coincidences are used in a destructive way. And this is one of the warnings I would have about synchronicity. It doesn't come with a moral valence. 
Um, we know that it is uh, very powerful. It has an it has a very uh, intense quality to it, and it can be enormously helpful, but it can be destructive. It depends on how you use it. I wanted to just read to you um, a bit about some reports at the time with all of these coincidences, uh, sort of just prior to this meeting that I've got on the screen here. Um, the cumulative effect was to create consternation, confusion, and doubt in the Aztecs, all of these coincidences, but especially in Moctezuma's mind. According to reports gathered from native witnesses, the apparent return of Quetzalcoatl left Moctezuma, in quote, terror struck. He was filled with great dread swooning. His soul was sickened, his heart was anguished. It is reported that he remarked, what will now befall us? In great torment is my heart, as if washed in chilly water. And the, the uh, Carrasco goes on to note his chilly water heart has taken on the character of what Rudolf Otto would call a creature feeling of numinous dread, awe and urgency. He is encountering his Newman, the origins of his rulership, and it is an uncanny experience. It is synchronistic. It's that sense of the synchronicity there. So it opens things up. But here again, um, and perhaps it's un inevitable in some way uh, that the conquest of Mexico would not go well uh, when, a, when a, a synchronicity is misused. But we now can come back and begin to think about what are the meanings of these synchronicities and these encounters and how else, if, if this had been a more empathic exchange, what that might have looked like. Uh, how these kinds of things could have been handled in a different way and what are what richness might have been might not have been lost. Um, so be it. I mean that's that's the kind of brief narrative. Let's take a, a second narrative um, that goes back a century or two before, and that's to the figure of Timur. Um, he's uh, in the line of Genghis Khan, uh, who's you know the 13th, 14th century conqueror. And he's another, uh, Timur is also known as Tamerlane or Tam Tamur the Lame uh, because he'd had a hip injury uh, in, in his youth. Uh, but he was a, a very, he was a remarkably complex figure in terms of the development of the Silk Road and, and the communication of multiple cultures, you know, the, the kind of internet of the, the medieval world in a way. And um, he was both a, a terrible scourge and, and millions of people died at his hands and his troops and yet brought great culture simultaneously. And so you have this, again, this sense of a very, very um, complex figure that's there. Here's his tomb in Samarkand in Uzbekistan. And he was on his way to try to invade the Ming dynasty in China when he fell ill with a flu uh, and died that winter. Um, but. Uh, on his own wishes, he put a curse uh, on his on his own tomb. And what he said, he had there were two engravings in there. The first one says, "When I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble." Tremble. And the second, uh, inside the tomb, says, "Whoever disturbs my tomb will unleash an invader more terrible than I." And the synchronicity comes hundreds of years later, and these synchronicities play out. Uh, when you have cultural synchronicities, they don't just play out in, over the course of a, a year or two in someone's life. They, they play out over the centuries. And that tomb was disturbed in June of 1941. There were Russian um, archaeologists sent there by Stalin, who was interested in this, this whole story of Timur. He saw him as a kind of prelude to himself. And he wanted, he had the body uh, disinterred. He, he uh, violated the tomb. Two days later, um, Operation Bar Barbarossa was launched by the Nazis. They invaded Russia. And it almost was a complete catastrophe. There were close to 20 million Russians died, oddly similar to the number of people that Timur had killed over the course of his life. But what happened is, and I don't know how apocryphal this is, except the, the events happened, uh, some people say that Stalin began to take the, the curse seriously as the 1941 and 42 un, unfolded. And finally, um, had the body reinterred with full Islamic rites into the tomb. A month later, Stalingrad fell. And that was, of course, the major turning point of the Second World War and the defeat of the Nazis. 
So it's it's been a it's been a fascinating story. This is there's a lot enough documentation, historical documentation, that this set of coincidences happened. What exactly it means? Is this genuine prophecy? How do we understand that? I, I think is interesting for us to discuss uh, in, in terms because obviously Stalin knew something about the curse and he was playing with it in a way. But I think it came alive. It activated the psyche, activated in a way that was totally unexpected. Um, I'm going to just say a few words about this, and, and we'll get we'll wrap up in just a couple of minutes. So I told you about um, the black forest and rhizomes, and this is a part of that general interest. Uh, I, I've been for years interested in biological intelligence. You might think about it from Jung and alchemical perspectives as the lumen naturae, the light in nature, in the dark, hidden in the dark of nature, that there's intelligence there, there's mind in there. And it isn't cranial and it isn't the, it isn't the kind of neural systems that we generally uh, uh, privilege on for ourselves. Um, but what this is here, this was a some engineers, uh, this was a scientific piece of research. What you're looking at um, are these uh, little uh, pieces here are, are oat, oat bran flakes. And they're put there at the rail stations uh, in Tokyo. This is a map of the city of Tokyo. Here's Tokyo Bay out here in the cities here. Here are all the rail stops. And some slime mold is introduced at the center of this and just allowed to grow for 26 hours. Well, uh, in its seeking out food, it creates a network. And here's the picture of, there's a schemata of the network. And here's what the, it took engineers about 15, 20 years to figure out what that rail network should look like. The point of the engineers were saying, you know, if we learn how to ask nature the right questions, if we engage nature, it will tell, give us a very good starting place. It will, it has some intelligence to bring back to us. And now people have gone on, um, to make these kind of observations about the, the, there's a kind of, and they link it to, uh, to psychology and so forth. I won't read through all of this for, for time purposes, but you can see that there's a kind of computational intelligence that's implicitly in there. It's not, they sit down with pencil and paper and work out equations, but the way in which they engage the world shows that kind of intelligence. Um, and that functions in all kinds of ways to, create these, these kinds of networks, the intelligence in nature, for example, trees that are interconnected to one another to form giant interconnected rhizomal networks. Uh, Peter uh, Wollaben's uh, Hidden Life of Books, which really comes off the research of Suzanne Samard up in British Columbia, shows the way these networks really function and create these structures. I think they're very important for us, uh, young, used rhizomes. Uh, he, he used the notion of the rhizome to explain the psyche. He said, you know, um, the individual is like the flower that comes up, the perennial flower that comes up and blooms and, you know, for one season and then it's gone, but the rhizome persists underneath and that's the collective psyche. And so I want to ask you what you might think this is. Uh, usually we have two guesses and, and they're close and they're linked. Um, and you can see the rhizomal structure here, you know, just the kind of um, like bamboo and everything else has this fundamental form. Well, three days after that, somebody per published this comparison. Uh, on your left is a uh, slice through a mouse brain showing uh, the neural network, mammalian brain neural network. On your right, is the cosmic web. That is the shape of the universe at its largest scale. What we have are clusters of galaxies held by dark matter and long filaments uh, and with the spaces in between of darkness caused by dark energy separating them. And so the uh, rhizomal structure of the mind of the universe bear close parallel. And just this year, some NASA scientists took that slime mold research and they said, let's do an algorithm on that. So they developed an algorithm about the way the slime mold grows and they applied it to this picture here, to the cosmic web and found that it was a very useful starting place to begin to understand the dynamics of how that cosmic web formed. So you see, we're getting to a place where um, 
our centrality, the, the uh, Anthropocene mess that we've made of our, our world is coming back for another kind of deeper look. And I think this is where, and if I had time, uh, but I don't think I should go on much longer. I think I'll wrap it up here. But the other part of the talk would be to go into the oracular traditions, the altered states of consciousness and to look at figures. Um, I'll just, sorry, I'll just go give the picture. The, the Pythia Delphi, uh, and there's now new evidence of what was the altered states that she was entering into and their noetic quality. And I think this is for, as depth psychologists, this is one of the pleas I would have that we begin to really explore altered states of consciousness for their noetic potentials. They may not tell us everything, but they certainly can tell us a lot and they'll tell us a lot about the nature of reality in the world. So. Um, with that, I think I will bring uh, this portion uh, to a close and return us back to the world of, of our panel and, and our conversation for the evening. So thank you all for your attention. Well, while Will is doing that, Joe, I, I just really want to thank you for a brilliant presentation. That was absolutely fabulous. I'm intrigued by the whole notion of the delocalizing and the break of between the subject and object. It sounds to me like we're talking about the participation mystique. And I'm wondering whether synchronicity is a more inhabited state of being for people who are in a condition of participation mystique. We may think of it as exceptional, but perhaps when we are bound up in a state of consciousness where we have, a, we have oneness, what we really have is a condition of synchronicity that is normalized. Yeah, one of the things that I've done some research on is um, the way Jung presents the synchronicity hypothesis, it's qualitative. That is, you're just sort of on or off. But he actually had some uh, queries back and forth, C.A. Meyer being one of the people who said, you know, I think the mind-body relationship is synchronistic. And Jung said, well, you know, if you're right, and I think you might be, then I've got to rethink this, that that there may be a level at which this is ordinary, that this is part of our or everyday world. And I think that there are a whole range of synchronicities. The intensity is probably linked with affect. So something like the scarab beetle or the black forest, they're pretty charged affectively uh, in terms of our experience. But I think there are other things uh, that, you know, having a reverie, you, you, you're thinking suddenly about a friend and the next thing you know, they call you on the phone. Huh, what do you know? Common experience we've all had. Um, I think there are many, many of these. And I would actually say that you could think about a Richter scale of synchronicities, that there are some rare, uh, very high intensity ones where there's a huge amount of affect going on and that kind of transformation. But there are other ones that are part of our everyday life. And we haven't had the psychological tools to recognize that and open this up. I I'm, I'm particularly interested with, uh, there's an anthropologist at uh, Stanford, Tanya Lurman, some of you may know her work. And her most recent book is, um, you know, uh, how God Becomes Real, that's the title of the book. And she's looking at the, the kind of psychological construction that has to go on. And this just this year, she's published a couple of papers that are looking at two things that are fundamental. One is porosity and the other is absorption. Porosity of, of our models of the mind. And our model is really unporous, the, the ones we've had. Synchronicity, as you're pointing to, this is where I'm coming, Dana, to, around to your point, is that Synchronicity takes that kind of rigid Cartesian separation of subject and object and says, it's no, it's actually a much more porous situation. Uh, and deep states of meditation that, that produce something like a cosmic web seem to me to be good examples of just exactly that kind of phenomena, that there's much more porosity than our models will give us the ability to use. But if we can begin as depth psychologists to reclaim that and then allow ourselves you know, like the Pythia is going to be something where you allow yourself in and get absorbed by that porosity, that there's something much more um, uh, powerful about uh, a window into the nature of reality uh, that's, that's possible there. 
Um, and so I think we need to map this out in, in a way. Some of it's already begun. I mean, the stuff with the LSD research and so forth was some first tries at, at beginning to find these. But I think if you look at shaman, uh, shamanic traditions around the globe, you'll find that these people were real psychonauts. They really did explore uh, a very broad range of states of consciousness and saw what you could get out of each of the different states. Our psychology is not there yet but it's something I think holds a, a future for us. Uh, Joe, it just uh, opened up so many corridors uh, for me and I'm sure for many others. One of the, one of the moments of synchronicity happens uh, in the classroom, and I know I'm not alone, where on a break, um, having been reading uh, the Odyssey together, a student will come up on the break and say, you know, this, this epic is exactly what I needed right now in my life because every, every, um, every action that is taking place with Odysseus, I feel connected to. So that's, that's one form. But the larger thing that I wanna bring up and then ask a question of you, one of the things that I enjoyed for decades teaching uh, was the long class days, um, essentially seven hours. And about three years ago, three years before I uh, went part-time, I, I really got interested in what kind of energy field is um, being constructed in the classroom around one or another of these uh, literary uh, epics. And so I started to time it over about two years, each quarter, and I didn't say anything to the students because I didn't want it to be, I didn't want them to be informed and then be shaped by it. But I discovered that it was uniformly an hour and 15 minutes, hmm. about the time that, you know, we'd be ready to take a break. And what I noticed is that when the field, and it, having the field in place didn't mean that we all agreed with one another, but there was a sense of a consensus. Um, the collective thinking deepened. The uh, level of the conversation deepened. And I just, I just found this absolutely marvelous and it was fragile. It could easily be uh, interrupted or disrupted but when everyone had bought into the experience, uh, the mimetic experience that the poet was uh, offering us, um, yeah, deepening is the best word that I can use. So here's, uh, this isn't seamless because I'm thinking this through. I took a few notes, but here's what I want to ask you. Um, is synchronicity, uh, no, let me reverse it. Is analogy forming um, a um, form of synchronicity? And it's not that I'm um, setting up something cause and effect, it, it bypasses that. So that here's how I wrote it to myself as I listened to you. This complex relationship between what I'm reading, hearing, and what relationship is forming in the field of that reading, um, is that synchronicity? In other words, is analogy a form that synchronicity takes to your thinking? Yeah, let me um, try to approach it from a couple of different directions. Uh, okay. Uh, what you're talking about is something I, uh, I'll, I'll slide the, the metaphor over to the clinical experience, but I think it's very parallel. <clears throat> because I found myself um, wondering why I had a thought about this kind of uh, image with this patient at this moment. And it's often when something deepens, when, when there's a kind of affective engagement, there's an yeah. empathic link 
and yeah. the images coming into being. And it caused me to go back and look at what's, what was Jung talking about with amplification? Why was that a meaningful technique? It's an allergy formation. I mean, it's the same thing. Yes. You yeah, know, you're, yeah. you're, you're sitting there with a patient and you're, you're working on something and suddenly an image starts to form in the mind and yeah. associations begin to build and you begin to recognize um, a, a kind of cultural analogy or a mythic analogy that often came to mind. And so that question of what's that doing, I began to look back at when, how Jung used it. And it seemed to me he had the intuition that something, a third was forming in, in, the, inter in yeah. the interaction, which is a kind of complex interaction of all the parts creating something, a third that's greater than any one of the individuals. That's the emergent yeah. form. And to glimpse that form, you use analogies to capture like a dye. You know, in other words, uh, I'll use a biological example. If I am uh, a novice and I'm studying um, one-celled creatures, it's very hard to see anything. You don't get any, any sense of the definition or form of the different parts unless you put a dye on them. Uh, you know, some, yeah. some kind of stain that brings out heightened features. Right. And then suddenly you start to be able to see into them with greater and greater clarity and you begin to notice all the different parts. There's a kind of enhanced differentiation. Well, I think that's exactly what amplification does. You, and it's not about using an intellectual analogy to no. um, somehow cognitively master this. It's really no. capturing what's coming into being in the room in the moment. Yeah, and beautiful. I think, I think that's what you're doing with your teaching. Yes, and you know, and I'll just uh, share this with uh, all of you, but uh, and you don't have to respond to this, but it feels right to express it. And um, in uh, in the uh, volume nine two, the ion volume, um, and I memorized this because it made such an impact on me when I read it many years ago. And I can even uh, tell you all the uh, paragraph is four one four. And Jung says this in a dependent adverbial clause, which I thought when I read it is the heartbeat of depth psychology. And here's what he says. Since analogy formation mm. is a law which to a large extent governs the psyche, comma, and then he has an independent clause that we don't need because it's uh, alluding to something in paragraph 413. When I read that, that an, the ability of the psyche to create analogies is a law of the psyche, I thought, well, that captures a great deal for me about what depth psychology uh, is contributing to the to the uh, to the world in a very transdisciplinary. I'll use Susan's word uh, way. The, the only thing I would add to that is the time dimension of it. You know, why this moment? You know, that analogy coming yes. into being, there's a time, there's a kairos to that. And I yes. think that's part of the synchronistic feel to, the, to these yes. things. Yes. There's an appropriateness. Um, and an appropriateness, yeah. Beautiful, Joe. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Dennis. Hey, can I jump in here? Uh, Please. Chris talking. Um, this has just been delicious. I mean, this is like a, a, a huge Thanksgiving meal, you know, with many, many courses and uh, something that uh, we're all going to be enjoying for quite some time. Um, just off of uh, what was just said by Dennis, um, one thing I've noticed is that uh, synchronicity seemed to follow kind of the same rules as dreams. Uh, especially a, a very vivid dream. Uh, it's something that it's vivid because it's uncanny. There's something about it that's not uh, natural or not, let's say, materialistic. It, it's, it's not in, from the world of cause and effect. Uh, and uh, in order to make use in your psychological development of a dream or of a synchronicity, uh, it really is for you to meditate upon. It's an object of meditation. And, and that's how I'm uh, processing the, the significant synchronicities, I think, in my own life is that uh, something perhaps inside me, perhaps external, that's another question. Uh, but something is trying to tell me something. And it's for me, as Jung did in, in great depth, uh, explored his own 
uh, uh, journey with that. But th there is a story making aspect to synchronicity that, that that's what you do. You make a story out of it. Uh, and I also would um, bounce off of uh, something you said, Joe, about, uh, and I didn't know this, about Jung pre predicting or his dreams and uh, meditations and visions predicting the, the horrors of war. Uh, this is something I've observed in the movie business, that movies are predictive. And that, um, you know, you, it was very obvious before World War II. Uh, if you look back at the movies from 1939, 36 through 39, uh, they know that war is coming and they know a lot about it. And it's expressed in many ways in, in uh, The Adventures of Robin Hood and uh, Warner Brothers gangster movies. Uh, uh, the metaphors are, are all pointing towards uh, what's coming down the pike. So those, those are a couple of, of thoughts. Um, and also just that uh, this is all slippery and difficult to deal with because we, we're stuck with words and the words are uh, placeholders, some people have said, for a mystery. And, and I think that was where uh, Joseph Campbell came in on things like this. Uh, it, it's a mystery beyond human comprehension, and we need the stories and the metaphors, and we need the stories we make out of the synchronicities uh, in order to, you know, stumble towards some kind of meaning. So where do you think these things come from? Uh, that's that's a, a, my pointed question out of this. Is, is, it, is it generated by the universe to guide us towards uh, some you know, a uh, greater level of understanding or uh, is this something we impose on it ourselves? Yeah, that's a, that's a question that people have struggled with and I don't know that I have an answer. My own experience leans in the direction of the first, that is that there does seem something, there's a telos, a deep telos in, uh, in these things that they add up. You know, if you study dreams, not just individual dreams, but you get a dream series, you begin to see a lexicon uh, evolving for a person. And as that person engages with it, that deepens and it brings more meaning. It isn't that they figure out a meaning, it's the meaning emerges out of the interactions with these things. <clears throat> so um, I think, you know, these altered states that we're talking about that people can enter into, which where, the, where time is not so linear and therefore the predictive piece, it's predictive for a kind of linear ego consciousness. I think in other, other kinds of cultures, these kind of altered states are known to have these kind of values. And it, the whole question of how much of, of our construction of time is an illusion, it's a cultural construction in a, in a subtle kind of way that we um, are so dependent on that it's extremely difficult to extricate ourselves from. Whereas, these these levels of experience may be simultaneously all present at, at the same time. You know, and a lot of the new work on quantum mechanics that I know about, about decoherence theory and so forth, are saying that you don't just collapse the wave function. You know, this was the old Copenhagen model. You know, it's at a particle or a wave while you're running through a slit and then it becomes one or the other. One slip, two slips, and you, you get these kind of things. But more and more, there's been uh, work and research to suggest that even if you have it start to manifest in one direction, the other states remain virtually there. And there's something about that virtual set of possibilities that we've not explored before. And they contain this level of, uh, of information and access. So I think that's where, if this is fundamentally part of the structure of the universe, and when I saw that that's cosmic web, it, it's just very hard for me to resist the temptation to say, this is so archetypal, this rhizomatic form. It, it's something we need to be better in touch with. Um, not that we figure it out, but, but it's a way of, it's the way the universe itself manifests. And are we part of that manifestation while we're fighting? So. Yeah, I, I uh, think here of, of uh, Terence McKenna, who oh, yeah. uh, sort of uh, tongue in cheek, uh, created a whole a complex order of levels 
of uh, where this stuff is coming from that he called the Cosmic Coincidence Control Center and said there were, you know, higher and lower versions of that. And we had some uh, bureau that was in charge over the earth of, give, of laying out these things. And, and I, I think he, he wasn't entirely serious about this, but uh, it, it does uh, uh, point to our need to understand, you know, we, we want to put names to things. We want to, uh, you know, uh, impose our materialistic uh, schemes on things. Uh, and, and that may be ultimately beside the point. Uh, and and uh, really, it doesn't matter if you get something out of it, just as with dreams and watching movies, uh, then then you're ahead of the game. There's a psychological experience. The other thing I would say that is in tandem with that, this whole question, synchronicity um, really does um, erode the notion of objectivity in the sense that um, there's an outside objective truth and, that, and that's of higher value and, and prominence uh, over subjective ex experiences. As you begin, it, it, synchronicity links the two of those together and flattens that uh, field, I, the whole question of authority begins to, to, to show because that objective authority that is right and correct no longer holds that centrality. I think it's, it's a real challenge to really deconstruct and decolonialize the way our models of the psyche have been. And we're, you're, you're really touching on that in a very nice way, I think. Thank you, Joe, for such a wonderful lecture. Uh, uh, it reminds me of the lecture you gave a few years ago at the Institute, and it was like for four hours. And I know that probably you have uh, uh, material for uh, 10 hours or more. And <clears throat> uh, I would still be very impressed by what you're saying. Uh, yeah, Jung was saying that really uh, insects are really closer to the formal principles uh, of nature. And so for us, it's something that is very difficult to understand. <clears throat> but yeah, you showed these images of uh, the ants. Uh, I remember that you showed some other images of uh, of uh, wasps, uh, uh, the, yeah. <laughs> and it was really very impressive to see that. I was always wondering what what is in the I don't know if you can say that what is in the mind of these insects when they do that, and uh, I, I don't I don't know if we're going to have the answer uh, the the response to this question at some point, but. Uh, it's always striking me. I don't think that we will understand anything about synchronicity if we, uh, before we understand how these insects uh, think. Uh, and, and so we're probably very far away from this. Um, uh, <clears throat> well, you know, as a quantum physicist, for me, there's always things that, uh, that um, um, question me. For example, when we talk about complexity, uh, I, I know that it's, uh, it brings something which is uh, the fact that the whole is more than the parts. And, but at the same time, I always feel that uh, in complexity, space is still space and time is still time. And so it's uh, still a kind of emergence. It's a kind of causality which is at work. There's always a code there. Uh, there's, mm -hmm kind of algorithm, uh, uh, it's a phase transition, there's all kind of things happening. Uh, and so it's not, it's not quite the way I understand uh, Jung's uh, way of looking at synchronicity. I know that we can extend that notion, but uh, the, the, the way Jung was pointing at, at synchronicity was the fact that time and state, space didn't exist at all in a way. There was something, uh, uh, there was a nothing, if, if I can say that. <laughs> but suddenly there was something happening, and and so it's been it's been always something which uh, for me is um, <clears throat> very profound. There is uh, a principle of nature which makes things happen, uh, and it's not it's not causal. It's not emergent. It's just happening. Uh, something is happening from. Uh, from nothing, and I don't know if it happens outside. Most likely, it might happen uh, in living uh, creatures like us, 
maybe it happens with ants. Maybe it happens with other insects. Mm -hmm. I don't know what creates reality. Um, I think uh, there's a kind of Cop Copernican shift that might uh, that we may might want to consider, which is the fact that reality out there doesn't exist. Uh, we as uh, human beings make that happen. And it's a kind of uh, different narrative, which is for me very fascinating to see that life is not emergent, it's there. And I don't know how it came there, but suddenly because we interact with each other, reality happens. And so I, I was just wondering if you had anything to say in that line and or maybe I'm just completely delusional. <laughs> and I've been waiting to hear each other's responses to this particular question of emergence for like five years, so. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's, it's a very good point he's, he's making. And I wanna be very clear here, emergence is not the end of the story. It's a, it's a way to get deeper into the story, but it's not the end. I wouldn't wanna stop there. Uh, from the very beginning, I've said, look, this will get us a chunk of the way further in the story. We can begin to see other things it gives us a set of tools to see a bit more, but it's not the end of, of the narrative or whatever synchronicity is. Because again, as you point out, you know, Jung's cosmology is that you know, pre-Big Bang kind of state. He's going back into something that we cannot grasp uh, through things that are already manifest and separated out. Uh, there's something more in that unis mundus kind of quality there that's, that's operative. Um, so I think there's there are some mysteries there that uh, we can you describe a lot of synchronistic phenomena with complexity theory. I think that's it's useful there to talk about phenomena, but that's not the same as the experience in itself at its core, or where it fundamentally comes from. The thing about insects, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I, you know, when I first got on this, I, one of the things I realized you read Freud on telepathy, and that's one of the first things he talks about. Because Freud was absolutely captured by telepathy. He, he was a very firm believer in telepathy. He thought his daughter, Anna, was particularly gifted. She probably was. And he, he, he tries to do a causal reductive move. He says, well, there, in, in evolutionary history, uh, these are earlier forms of communication and they're not as effective as language. So, you know, psychoanalysis tends to lean towards the lingu linguistic expression. But he was saying that there was something about the kind, especially in the social insects, the way in which the interactions create a uh, distributed, non-local kind of network that has its own intelligence. And I think uh, that's certainly something that I'm seeing more and more in terms of uh, complexity of intelligence. Nature has two solutions. One is to put a bunch of neurons inside of a inside of a closed box, like a cranium. And another one is to have a bunch of interactions going on between uh, linked uh, individuals. And that creates another kind of intelligence. Uh, and, you know, the, the example you were talking about, about the uh, beetle larvae who go on that mythic journey, um, you know, by, they're picked up by the bee and then they're carried back to the, to the hive where they eat the, the, uh, the um, pollen. And that's part of their transformation is, yeah, it's, it's these mythic narratives that are fundamentally there in nature. You know, we're, we put language on them, but in fact, um, there's a lived quality that, that's fundamental to the way nature just is. It isn't even about trying to express itself. And the complexity stuff comes out of a lot of research about the failure of uh, a Darwinian explanation to talk about the origins of life. Complexity tries to get at that question. I don't think it's really going to get there, but I, I think it, it is heading in that. It's part of its arc. So, um, and insects, you know, one last thought, thought about that that comes to mind. You know, in the last year or so, there have been all of these scientific hypotheses that insects have feelings, primitive feelings. They're, they're, they're more and more capacity to register. There's something affectively going on. So not only are you afraid of a spider, but it can be afraid of you. Uh, you know, that, that there's a whole other level of animation to the world. And I think that's part of our models are the mechanization of the world and the reclaiming of what life is. That it's not a, um, a very sophisticated mechanism, but there's something fundamentally wrong with that. I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah. Well, I heard a story uh, uh, 
just maybe two weeks ago about bees. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, someone was talking about bees and uh, he was actually talking from his office and was saying that at some point uh, at his, uh, university, he decided to put a hive next to his office and he was a little bit scared of that. Mm -hmm. because it's not, it's, well, you don't want to have too many bees around you. And so one day what happened is there was a bee uh, in his office <clears throat> And it was a bee that was walking, it was not uh, flying. And so he, he knew that it was a sign that the bee was a little bit uh, uh, tired, mm -hmm. uh, that happens. And so he knew, uh, he, well, he, he was in contact with a beekeeper. So he knew that if you give some uh, honey uh, from the hive to the bee, uh, then it can really uh, get some energy. And, uh, <clears throat> And so it, this is what he did. He gave, I don't know where he got the honey, but he gave some honey to the bee. <laughs> bee just uh, uh, ate the honey or I don't know, drank the honey and then started to fly away. And then from this day on, uh, he had no problem at all with the hive uh, next to, to his office. There was a kind, the word was transmitted that basically, well, this guy is good. Just... <laughs> And so there's a kind of intelligence here. It's really absolutely uh, just a very quick response. The pandemic has has opened a lot of this up for people. I've certainly noticed it myself. I, I have a backyard that has a lot of birds, and I, I do things to get birds to come in there. You know, certain plants and so forth. And I always have been seeing the birds as I, I would always try to be very cautious and careful and not scare them away. And I started watching during the pandemic on, on a more regular basis. And I began to realize they actually come in the yard when I'm, uh, when I'm in um, a sort of an enclosed space doing a bit of exercise. And I, I finally figured it out the other day. I watched the cats in the neighborhood come through the yard until I'm out there and then they leave. Uh, and when the cats leave, the birds feel safe. I had no idea of this kind of communicative pathway that was going on until suddenly I caught it and because I was there for about 10 minutes and it was the wrong time of day and suddenly the yard filled up with birds. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is what's happening. So the, these relations to nature, I think we have to open our minds up as to what those are like and how those happen. They, they don't happen in the way we want to do our kind of uh, plan, Francis and Cece uh, kind of moves, I'll, I'll be kind and this will happen. I think it's it's another kind of empathy uh, with the other. Oh, this this uh, intelligence that you're talking about is it's actually, I, I wanna jump on and ask a little bit about it. And I wanna take a kind of a curve there and say, where we're asking about these, the intelligence of the insects in the context of synchronicity, which is a, a beautifully interesting question. What if we put that right next to the intelligence of characters that are playing out a story. And, you know, Chris is here and we've talked about this and there's always a conversation about the hero. Is the hero the one driving the whole narrative, knows what's going on, ultimately has the authorship to make it happen. But a lot of times, you know, I think that to come into this conversation of the division between subject and object, individual and whole, if the hero represents this striving individual, so often, that striving is not at all what, what results in the success of the story. Sometimes it's used, sometimes it's manipulated, uh, but often the, the story, um, the climax of the story, and I think especially great stories right now, uh, are stories that are making that ant bridge where what's happening is some kind of solution that is emergent, that cannot come from an individualist psyche, that cannot come from a single person trying to solve the problem. And I just think it's really cool to see that example, that ant bridge may be a perfect metaphor, not just for how we might try to live, but also for the type of stories we might be trying to create, you know, like what if we start actually working backwards from the creation of stories that encourage us not to put our emphasis on the individual, but on the emergent capacity of, of the collective. That's a wonderful idea, Will. It makes me think um, the, the the stories that have often caught my imagination are the dumbling stories. The the, uh, the third brother, you know, for example, in a fairy tale, the one that uh, is not the brightest or not the most athletic or whatever it is, goes off on a journey and has a kind of empathic kindness and relationship to the world. And that brings things in that otherwise wouldn't happen, that, that the heroic, uh, egoic, 
kind of conquering perspective can't get to. And I think that there's something about that kind of dumbling psychology that's closer to a synchronistic world. It's a kind of mental state uh, from a story. Or it's gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Being there, yeah. Thanks, thanks. And I, I would love to yeah, continue to hear people's thoughts about, about that because, you know, I so many directions to take this conversation and it's so beautiful to see that we're taking it so many ways. Uh, thank you. And, and I see Zaman wants to ask us something. So um, I really enjoyed the presentation and um, was wondering if we can move from the bees to the reptiles. Uh, <laughs> uh, the first word that drew my attention very, very deeply in the very first slide you showed was the word a causal. Yes. And as I was thinking about the causality element, where did causality come into existence, at least in the Islamic mythology, the word a causal sounds like ekala. And ekala is um, the serpent shaped turban that the Arabs wear. Oh. And it originates in the, uh, in the myth of the Garden of Eden, uh, where uh, the Quranic uh, narrative is there, there is no Eve there, so it's, it's a one being. Uh, uh, that uh, Adam, uh, the androgynous Adam, questions the reason as to why would God create all these trees and fruits and everything around and then tell, tell him, okay, uh, tell him or her not to touch, not to approach that one tree. And so Adam looks for a reason. And the reason is, uh, comes to him in the form of a serpent that goes to the Garden of Eden. Yeah. And so uh, serpent um, is where, uh, becomes the cause. So he's looking for the cause of why, this, why am I not supposed to uh, eat of that forbidden fruit, so to say. Um, then when you write the word ekala in Arabic, you write it with a loop in the middle, with a knot. And the knot has two significance. One, um, which I think is more symbolic of for whatever reason, is that uh, it is a knot that ties cause with the effect. It can not only connects them, it's the tying them together. So the tying together of the cause and the effect takes the shape of a, a loop, which is like a Ouroboros, which is the serpent, which is the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which is the serpent that asked, that brought up the questions of why not eat of the forbidden fruit, uh, which then when you pronounce the word ekala, it sounds like a causal. <laughs> which connects back to, to your talk. And so it's kind of going back and forth in my head and saying like, wait a minute, which is it? Is it causal or is it a causal? And of course, if we understand it in terms of uh, bees and insects and uh, you know, uh, serpents and uh, the nature, birds talking to us, um, then it cannot be uh, necessarily causal because Cause for us uh, the logos equivalent of Arabic is uh, again it's uh, akal, which is akala, which is the talk, which is the word. Um, so I I think there is a whole lot to explore in that sense. Yes, um, uh, Indo-European languages are not connected with the Semitic languages, so we cannot connect in linguistically there. Mm -hmm. But what a, a what a synchronicity that. The very in the very beginning, the two words that is establishing or at least questioning the causality in the two languages sound exactly the same, and that's what I was thinking. And uh, there it goes, right in, in the very first slide of your presentation. So uh, uh, I think that's a, a synchronicity by itself. But I would like to hear your comment on it. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating. I think the braiding of the causal and the effect. Is, is really, I, I mean, as I was listening, it's the thing that struck me the most, that <clears throat> the way we've developed our scientific mind has been to put those in a time sequence in a particular way. When you do the loop, you, you begin to um, 
deconstruct time in, in that way. You move outside of that. And when you braid cause and effect into a, a pattern, then I think what you're looking at is a very different nature of reality than what we get when we, when we straighten that all out. Uh, the impulse to, uh, to take the curves out of these things is, is I think, uh, pretty, pretty much the problem. And what about the, the tree uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, of knowledge that we're not supposed to eat from? Is, is that something about seeing through language? In, in the way that you're talking about it, but, you know, to really truly know that these are constructions uh, that we use to navigate reality, but then we've, we've in a way lost our way and forgotten that it's, it's linguistic play to create the alternative narrative out there of what we're seeing rather than the direct experience uh, of, of what it is that uh, we truly can, can taste. And, and you, in a way, you can also look at it in, in the cultural context, too, that yes. that turban the Arabs wear, which is like a serpent around their head, which is the reason on the outside. And then there is a reason the brain on the inside and they put the two together. And um, uh, I, I don't know how much of that is, again, a coincidence. Uh, culturally, they could have adopted any kind of uh, uh, turban, clothes, whatever to wear. But, but the shape of the, the turban they wear is exactly the shape of the uh, Ouroboros or the serpent, which brought us down here, the cause of our sort of fall in the first place. Um, but uh, again, uh, more, more uh, opportunities for further exploration, I guess. Yes, thank you. I mean, in, in that sense, um, you know, in, the, in this symbolic traditions, oftentimes hair is seen as what comes out of the head and it's linked to the imagination. And so therefore not cutting one's hair is to let the imagination really unfold, and really get its full uh, expression. Uh, and, and that's something, you know, the question is what's then our relationship to the imagination as a, uh, as a real organ of uh, experience and knowledge. Joe, thank you so very much. What an exquisite presentation. Um, I'm going to come at this from a more clinical perspective. Uh, synchronicity certainly illuminates the psychological path forward for a client. But I think not enough is talked about how that interfaces with the therapist and how that opens that up completely. And so not only for the therapist, if you're in a marriage or in a relationship and you're having these synchronistic things, another dimension is opened up. So I, I think whether it's therapeutically or relational, I think we need to look at how this interface happens in our everyday life. Can you speak more to that? Yeah, I mean, when these things have happened clinically, um, it's opened my eyes to a different level of connectedness with the client that, where that's happened, number one. That's just sort of the first layer of it. It's like, whoa, there's a connection here beyond what I was seeing from a from the clinical training perspective. It doesn't give us that, that whole depth of the unconscious to unconscious communication, which links into something larger. But it also, uh, I found over time, uh, if I were telling, uh, if I were giving a clinical presentation, I would give some examples of things that happened and the consequences unfold over 20, 30 years. That it, it's like these cultural things that, that unfold. Once these things are established, it's really like an entanglement, you know, from quantum physics. It, it has that, that quality that once the particles have engaged with one another, they're, they're connected in a way, unless something's disturbing that. I've, I've had a person I had seen, oh, 25 years previous, came to mind when I was asked to give a paper on a clinical presentation. And um, I hadn't asked permission, so I couldn't use it. And three weeks later, that person called me for a consultation and it ended up going directly to what I wanted to talk about. I, I didn't try to direct it there. And I could just see the power of that, the, the way in which the psyche didn't belong to that person or me. You know, Jung has this statement that Actually, when we dream, it's not out of ourself or the other, but what lies between. 
It's that interactive field between us. And that, I mean, to me, that's the analytic or therapeutic mind is the field mind, not the kind of individual uh, experience. And therefore, I think this is part of, there's no way to do this without being transformed yourself. You cannot have these kind of clinical experiences without it fundamentally altering who you are. Or I don't think much happens. If you're not open to that, then, then I think maybe you offer a little CBT and on, on their way they go. So at least that's some first thoughts about that. Thanks. And Joe, I just want to bring a couple people into the room. Firstly, uh, Voris, who's normally with us, wasn't able to start with us. So hi, Voris. Thanks for, for joining us when you could make it. Um, and also uh, Becca Tarnas, who gave a presentation with us uh, on the Red Books, uh, which very much touched on some synchronicities uh, just two myth salons ago. Thanks for joining us, uh, Becca. And I think we're also maybe be inviting in um, the gentleman who's giving a presentation, Lawrence, uh, on synchronicity at the Young Institute this, this Friday. And we'll make sure we share an event uh, link on that below as well. So always cool to see the uh, synergies and synchronicities. And, and with that, you know, I just wanted to see if Forrest had anything to, to come in with. Uh, I know you came in a little bit after some of the talk, but always love hearing from you. Uh, thanks. Thank you for the, uh, for the invite. I was going to remain quiet. Uh, <laughs> uh, but what I heard, I do have a, a question. Uh, in terms of this, um, relationality as it relates to not only psych the psyche, but as it relates um, to quantum physics. I really like what you have to say about um, uh, the cats <laughs> and they're leaving and this, and, and you're being unaware of that. Um, and in the academy, you have folks like Deleuze and Guattari and some others who are arguing for the radical relationality of the universe. And that indeed it is in, it is in those in-between internecine spaces um, that life's, uh, the meaning can be experienced. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Or are you arguing something differently? I think that's a, a pretty important point of it because again, it's the mutual constructions of these things. Uh, you know, from a clinical perspective, it's it's uh, the quality of this is just so much. Uh, it's just radically different when it's an engagement with somebody else and the feeling of uh, uh, kinship and um, of knowing one another. I mean, it isn't knowing all the details about somebody, but it's a sense of there's a kind of transparency and a being with that mm -hmm. I find extremely powerful. And you know, just just to, you triggered one thing. When when I had that uh, experience with the woman with the black forest, we never never discussed it. Um, I never even mentioned it. But you know, within three months, she started dreaming of being underwater and kind of getting in a bit of panic and dreaming I would show up with a uh, with tanks of oxygen and do buddy breathing. You know, if you're a diver, you share that. So her psyche got her at a deep level. I, I was just so taken by the wisdom in, in that client who was struggling with all kinds of very painful, difficult traumas. And yet something in her had the intelligence to really grasp at a very deep level and, and really hold me in, in a way, uh, you know, it's like, we're both in this, <laughs> we're both in the drink. I may be providing certain resources, but I'm also undergoing something here myself. And so it's that relationality for me that where the transformation, transformational value of the synchronicities happened. You know, I just want to point out, uh, we are going to have so many more questions than we can possibly get through on synchronicity. It's one of those flowers. It's like the, the golden lotus of the Nile that just keeps opening a new flower every day. And so would love to just make sure everybody knows that on the event page for this, there's going to be a place where any ongoing conversation can continue to happen. So just want to make sure everybody knows about that. And with that, I just want to invite Becca in. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, bringing me in here. I wasn't uh, expecting to join the panel. Um, I, I have to just share what brought me here tonight because um, I'm currently teaching at Pacifica 
uh, the course on synchronicity that was originated by Dr. Cambry and uh, Kieran LeGrice. And so last week, I am uh, was deep in composing my lecture based on your book, Synchronicity. And I was right at the end, starting to feel a bit tired. And I was like, I'll take a little break. I'll check my email. I shouldn't check my email. I should finish this. I'll ch I checked my email. Top email that just came in, subject heading says, how synchronistic that you should be seeing this. I open it up. And there's the announcement for this event with the cover of Joe Cambry's book right there, the copy of his book open on my desk. They're just right next to each other. Um, so it was just this beautiful affirmation and there was no way I could miss this. One of the things we didn't get to was the last two events. We've talked about books falling off shelves and hitting people on heads. So thanks for making sure that one made it in this time. <laughs> That's great. Um, I don't want to take up too much time at the ending here. So maybe this is just a, a drop to, to put in that can ripple into later conversations. But in exploring synchronicity as an a-causal connecting principle, one thing that keeps coming to mind from my philosophical background is leaping back to more than 2000 years to Aristotle, who spoke about multiple forms of causality, not just material and efficient, which is what we see represented in classical physics, but um, former formal causality, uh, as we see represented in Rupert Sheldrake's morphic fields, or final causality, which implies a teleology. And I would be curious um, if anyone has any thoughts on these two other forms of causality, if it makes sense for us to reintroduce them into the discussion of synchronicity, and then is it really a causal or is it a different form of causality? I know it's a huge topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're right to deconstruct uh, our more restricted visions of causality. I think that um, and that model of causality that we have is, is again, an energetic uh, mechanistic model. That's really what's behind it. And the, these other aspects, the formal and the final, really have uh, something to do with sentience and, and life itself as a part of what's giving shape and form to all of this. And I think that's part of the mystery that's not going to get solved by the kind of science that we've had up to date. That's more and more evidence philosophically, you know, that, that, that that's a dead end for us. We've been trying and trying and trying, and we don't solve that. So I think. How do, we, how do we begin to take those kinds of conceptions of causality and, and really uh, take a deep dive into them and reimagine them? It's, it's a wonderful project. You know, Lawrence, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, and I know that, the, speaking of, if you, if you have more interest in synchronicity and want to go further into it, I know there's an event literally tomorrow night at the Young Institute. So, uh, Lawrence, wondering if, you, if you've had any reflections uh, listening to Joe tonight. Okay, well, thank you, Joe, and greetings from Australia, where we've had virtually no coronavirus. Yes, I know. Yeah. Totally free where I am in Queensland, and we've had seven deaths in the huge state. Um, but I'm looking at coronavirus, it struck me that this is an unbelievable uh, cultural synchronicity, because without it, Trump would have been re-elected and there'd be no hope for the environment. Instead, we have hopefully FDR Jr. And uh, if you have any reflections on this, I would love, love to hear it. Yeah, um, well, it starts with the kind of the models of climate change that are, that are beginning to emerge. Where does this, you know, if we get past the, uh, it was invented in a lab fantasy, which is what it is, an, an attempt to, uh, to create more uh, Asian hate that, that uh, Dana was touching on at the beginning. Uh, in fact, there's pretty good evidence that what's happening is as the planet's heating up, animals who are in the tropics are going to higher latitudes to retain livable environments, and they're getting into engagement with species. Uh, these are chance engagements with species that migrate that they normally wouldn't be encountering. And so we're, we're creating new encounters by that. And this is where you get opportunistic viruses that hop. 
cross species. And it's very clear to me when you look at that research that if we don't pay attention to coronavirus, we're gonna have a lot more of this. This is not once in a, this was once in a century in the past. This is gonna be more frequent. This is gonna be our future. So this is a part of it. And we need to really grapple with that. I mean, in a way there's all kinds of strange silver linings with this, as you pointed out, the political aspects, there's been a new kind of ecological awareness that uh, the pollution has dropped with the air travel going down. And part of it is, is what do we do with it? You know, it's, it's a psychoid phenomenon. As I mentioned at the beginning, viruses are these very strange organisms that uh, are be right at the edge, right at the edge between living and not living. You can crystallize them. You, and they've done this with the coronavirus. You can um, crystallize it, put it into a jar and put it on a shelf and just leave it there for 10 years and then bring it back, bring it into solution. And then boom, you've got it. It's live and active. And, and that kind of at the edge of uh, this, where something could be psychic, animated or not, says that we've got a psychoid phenomenon. That's what we're unleashing in this. And that tells me, well, that's what, Jung said was that it's a psychoid archetype that's activated when you have a synchronicity. So I read the corona situation as a, as a, a global synchronicity that's going on. And that how do we then stand in relationship to that? That's, that's the, what, what meaning are we going to make out of that? So are we just going to return status quo ante? I certainly hope not. I mean, certainly it's driven us into, you know, just think about what's happening here. We're all in these different spaces simultaneously. Nobody's psyche was evolved to see 10 different, 15 different rooms simultaneously, at different time zones, different lighting, different sounds. Our psyches are not adapted to this. We're creating another kind of cyber reality that wasn't there before. Where that will lead us, I don't know, but uh, I think there's something synchronistic about this moment. And I think it's about being at an edge of, uh, you know, this may be one of the last moments where we can save ourselves as a species. If, if we, we need to be conscious of our impact on the globe or the, like with the bee, if you don't feed it honey, you know, uh, you're gonna get stung. If you feed it honey, if you start to pay attention to what's going on and become empathic with this creation, hopefully something new can come, but I don't know, it gets my ecological <laughs> mind going, so. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I think there's a whole link between ecology and synchronicity. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> well, it does, Joe, seem to be pointing us to uh, the toll booth to pay the huge price that our separation from the natural world has created for us, that we are now all stuck in our isolated rooms trying to we do our best to communicate as a collective and to overcome the natural impulses to, uh, to come together. Um, it's the best we can do under the circumstances. And, and you can see the impulses just going wild in the culture as everybody is chomping at the bit to get back to work, to get back to congregate, to do everything. And it doesn't to me appear that we've really uh, solved the issue or comp compensated effectively for the nature of the coronavirus. So I'm struck by, we're paying the price that, of having separated ourselves from the, the entirety of oneness by launching into as um, I think it was Susan Bordeaux um, creating separations between subjectivity and objectivity. You know, when we, when everything was oneness, there was a condition where synchronicities would have been more or less normal because that's the way in which reality behaves. It's as if the Tao is having its manifestations and we are just one with the Tao. So, I am deeply appreciative with Will that you responded to our, our invitation to come on here. And I really wanna thank Christoph and I wanna thank uh, Chris Vogler. Lawrence, thank you. I didn't mean to out you by coming on 
here. I saw your name was on there. And I said, oh, my goodness, look at who we have here tonight. Is this really cool? And Becca, thank you for joining us. Zaman, Selena, Dennis, Boris, what a, what a great evening. I mean, we are, as we're going forward, we have a, a meeting among ourselves as panelists to discuss the largeness or smallness or what's appropriate for the Myth Salon and how we're going to structure the panel in the future. But I think we're seeing one of the virtues of a large panel when we get this many quality educators on here in these minds. I mean, this has been a fabulous, fabulous evening for us, Joe, and I thank everybody for being part of it. However, against the backdrop of the talk, what I would like to do is go out with a moment of silence. So if you'll please reflect momentarily, please let's, uh, Let's listen to this. I'll never figure out how to get this thing properly situated. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending another Miss Salon for making this such a viable part of our community at Pacifica and otherwise. I love everyone. Thank you so much. And Joe, Lawrence, Christoph, Chris Vogler, everybody, all my friends and loyalists as panelists, I could do this forever. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Joe. What a rich evening with all of you. I just gained so much from it. Yep. Thank you all for your yep. contributions. Just beautiful. Thanks. Gives me a wonderful sense of uh, something marvelous to play with. This is a something I just have that feeling. This is this is a, a source of play, uh, and I think Jung found that late in his life that uh, uh, there, were, there these are things to play with. Yeah, and you all contributed to making the field active and alive. So thank you all. Thank you.